Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my view of why RL algorithm can work. And uh, I'm going to talk about robustness and realization of both risk as a way to understand, or risk mitigation as a way to understand why uh, those algorithms uh, work. So uh, I think we've talked a lot about RL in the last uh, three days, and we'll talk about sequ sequential decision making. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples that uh, I want to uh, see a little bit uh, further down, uh, down the talk. First one is uh, American put options. So this is uh, perhaps the most uh, common uh, option. Uh, there is a, an expiry time t, there is an execution price k, and basically uh, you need to decide uh, if the price is going to go above or below uh, the, red, uh, the red line. If it goes above, then uh, if you execute the option, you make money. However, if you're going to just just wait until it touches uh, the red line, and then you're going to execute, you're going to make essentially make zero dollars. So it's in your best interest to try and catch the top. But if you catch the top, then it's great. But maybe you know, if you think that the top is here and you're going to wait a little bit, uh, then you, know, you can make more money. So the question here is when to execute uh, uh, the option, and um, and this is a sequential decision problem. Course. Um, it's probably the most common decision problem that uh, is made on the on planet, uh, by the way, and, um, and probably the most, most worthwhile to solve. So we haven't solved it, unfortunately, but, uh, um, but it's still very interesting and there is a lot of data about, uh, about uh, uh, options. Uh, that's a more uh, classical domain, more robotics like, that's uh, the pinball domain. So in the pinball domain, there is a red ball, uh, there is a blue ball, and there is a red uh, target, and you want to get uh, to push uh, uh, push the blue ball to the red target, and sort of you have to push the table. So uh, you control the dynamics uh, somehow, somewhat, and you want to make sure that uh, uh, the blue ball gets to the red uh, dot, and it's really a stochastic shortest path problem. So we look at those two problems that we want to uh, we want to solve. So uh, and and basically this is a. Uh, in this work, we talk a lot about uh, the connection between optimal control and uh, statistics. So uh, we have a large scale stochastic domain. The domain is ill specified. We don't really know how an option behaves. Um, there are about 10 or 15 different stochastic models for that, from a simple random walk to very complicated uh, um, uh, stochastic uh, differential equations uh, uh, models. None of them, of course, is true. Uh, for the people in the domain, the physics are quite complicated in general. Like we don't understand the physics all the way. Um, so this is a slide that just explains the model. And um, in this talk, uh, we're going to, to look at the, the simplest model, which is an MDP model. So we have, uh, this is a slide you've seen before. Uh, it's interesting that some of us put the agent above the environment and some of the agent besides the environment. But besides that, you've seen that before. So we have an agent, we have an environment, our actions. The agent sees the current state of the system, obtains a, re a reward. Uh, use an action, something happens to the environment here, which is stochastic, and as a result, a reward is given and the state uh, changes. So this is a classical model, and the model is that you, you know the state space, you know the, what actions are available to you, uh, but you don't know the transition probabilities or and the rewards, at least not initially. So this is a very simple RL model. Uh, in some problems, you don't even know the state space and the action, but let's just keep it simple for now. And the objective, the classical objective, is to find a policy uh, that maximizes your expected discounted reward. So basically, you need to find a prescription that tells you what to do, uh, what the agent should do uh, to, mean, to maximize uh, this expected reward. So think about the option problem. You have an option you want to execute so that you're going to maximize the amount of money that you get. Pretty simple. So uh, just this is, a, a, this is a, a, a quote of like that we don't really believe our model. So we don't believe that we can model the environment, and in practice it's impossible to model the environment correctly. So we have a model, we kind of trust it, maybe not really, uh, uh, but we still want to make, it, uh, to make use of it. Uh, so uh, why should we be risk sensitive? So in this example, think about uh, this, uh, uh, this is me and this is the airport. I want to get from uh, where I am to the airport. There are two lines, that, two uh, routes I can choose. I can go from the safe route it is longer, so you take a train in Israel, or I can go through, through the highway, which is short, shorter, but may, take, may be uh, a little bit more dangerous. So basically, you should come out like that. There, is a, there are two routes. Uh, there is a, the top route and, and, and the bottom route. There is toxicity that is 
um, caused by either not knowing the model or by not knowing exactly uh, um, what is going to happen or some stochastic uh, uh, eventualities. So if I'm going to take the lower route, which is in principle shorter, uh, I'm looking at uh, this green histogram of time. So an average is I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to, get uh, to the airport and, and faster. However, uh, it may happen that the probability of much longer duration is there. So for me, the risk of not getting to the airport on time, like let's suppose missing the flight, uh, that could be a, a disaster. So I might prefer to choose a longer route because it's safer. So this is to illustrate uh, the concept of, uh, of risk here. Okay, so uh, our claim, uh, which we'll show uh, uh, precisely, is that risk awareness is going to uh, um, lead to policies which are robust. We'll make it uh, so it's policies that uh, know how to handle um, the situation that uh, the environment is not exactly what I thought it is, but also that those are going to generalize uh, better. And just let me show you what I mean by that. So this is a small movie. I'll play it a few times. So let's see it from the start. Uh, right. So I'm trying. Uh, the, the, my here, my model is wrong. I get confused. It takes me a lot of time. I push it in the wrong direction. It takes me longer. Here, my, I got uh, uh, the, the right. Uh, the, my policy is recently. It went from. I took the detour, and here my model is wrong, uh, but because I, I'm taking a safer policy, I'm going to eventually get to the right place in, sh uh, in a shorter time. That's just to illustrate uh, the case. Well, that's <laughs> what you are confusing between short in distance and short in time, which is something right. so we do with our navigators all the time. No? That's right, I agree with that. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about types of, of uncertainty. So the first fact is that I have the model correct, but I'm not exactly sure what are my parameters. So in this case, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I will really think that I know kind of what the, the, the parameters are, but probably I have here some perturbation of that, that the, the true parameters are perturbation of, uh, of the parameters that I have in mind. So uh, in this case, it's customary to look at what's known as a robust objective, so I want to find the policy that is going to give me the, the best reward, given that the model is going to be the worst possible model. So that's a max-mean uh, problem. And that's a, a, you know, the, the origins of this problem are robust uh, control. It's a fairly simple problem. So uh, if we know how to solve it, uh, then if we know how to specify the model here, uh, usually we can solve it. Uh, let's talk about the other type of uncertainty. So here I know the model, I believe it, but my word is to cast it. So I can look at the expected uh, utility, which is a typical thing we do. But let's play the following game. So I propose to play a game with you guys. Um, if you'll choose uh, uh, the first game, then we'll just play for a dollar. That seems like a friend of a match, right? Everybody would be happy to do that. And then in the second game, we're going to uh, play for a for, for thousand dollars. Or if, if you're richer than I am, maybe for a million dollars. I think less people here would be willing to uh, play this game. So, and the issue is that the expectation is the same in both cases. So expectation is the same, but it does not convey a notion of risk. And our preference, as was shown by many, many people from uh, Kahneman and Tversky and to many others, are uh, humans are usually risk averse. So um, the, the, the idea here is to look at a different objective. So the objective, instead of being the expectation, is going to be some risk measure. For example, we can look at the expectation minus constant time standard deviation. So here we do not assume that there is any lack of knowledge about the model. The model is perfectly known. We can write this expectation, we can optimize according to it, we can sample from it. However, we, do not, we are risk averse in the sense that we, do not sure, uh, we don't want to look at expectation, but rather it's something more uh, uh, conservative. Well, this is the second type of concern. And then there is a, a third type, which is the most interesting one. And that's when the model itself is not known. So as Peter said, every, every, every RL problem has three ingredients. So it's the reward, the model, and uh, the observations. And in this case, 
uh, um, we just don't know what the model is. So we're just going to look for a policy that's going to still behave well against uh, the worst possible model that we can accom uh, accommodate. So we want to handle the model mismatch um, explicitly. And think about the options problem. So in the options problem, we, we can talk about stochastic differential equation to model the, 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 the price of the fluctuation of financial assets. And that's great, but nobody really believes that the, 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 the price of an option, of in this case of a Yahoo stock or Google stock, is, is something that behaves like a Wiener process. So we don't show what the model is, and we still want to do uh, uh, to be able to solve, uh, solve something. So let me let me go back uh, a little bit and talk a little about regularization. So let's uh, try to see what regularization has to do with robustness and risk. So uh, for that, I'm going to uh, use a supervised learning setting, and I'm going to remind you a result uh, that is kind of interesting. So this is a supervised learning setting. You have data x and y. x are the input, y are, are the outputs. You can think about it as a classification problem if you wish. So x is the data that you have, and y are the labels, say, plus minus one. Classical machine learning 101. Um, the ERM concept, the critical risk minimization, tells you that you're going to choose, um, say, a classifier that is going to minimize your empirical loss. This is a, a classical concept of machine learning. And then the tweak that people have been doing in the last 30 or 40 years is to regularize. So instead of minimizing just the empirical loss, you add some regularization to uh, term for it. And the argument is usually that this is going to give you some, um, some, some uh, a lower complexity. So this has been around for many, many years. It's a very basic concept, and SVMs are for in SVM, you use a, um, the regulation term is a, an L2 uh, a norm. Uh, you can think about a lasso as regressors here, and many, many other classifiers. Essentially, all classifiers, I would say, until the age of uh, deep learning, uh, have the, the, and, and the all useful classifiers. So what about our L? How do we regularize in our L? So you can think about regularization as a seeking simplicity, uh, according to uh, Occam's razor. So what is simple? Is the value function simple? So should the value function be a low dimensional manifold? Why would we believe that the value function is going to be simple? Should it be simple? So, so people have worked on that, myself included, trying to look for, for simple value function. I think in practice it fails. There is no reason to believe that the value function is going to be simple. So what about model selection? So model selection is another interesting idea. Um, you may want to opt for a simple model that explains the data fairly well. That works for some problems, not for a very interesting problem, I have to say. And then maybe we should represent the policy in a simple way. So in principle, this sounds like a good idea. In practice, I'm in doubt. So if you want to represent a complex policy, I mean, if, things, if you want to solve real problems, then you need complex policy. There's just no way around it. So, Simplicity is, is something which is, uh, uh, which is a little bit elusive. How do you define elusive uh, simplicity or uh, realization for uh, RL? So let me offer another approach here. So instead of looking at, at direct simplicity, I'm going to use something I think uh, Minsky said, that learning is, is more, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase, machine learning or learning in general is, more, is not only about attention, but also about inattention. So it's not only about understanding and remembering, but also about forgetting. And, and figuring out what you should know and what you should not know. So uh, to, to, to be less philosophical about it, so uh, in, again, going back to a supervised learning uh, um, um, approach, um, setting, we had a sequence of papers, a sequence of students actually, that, uh, um, that uh, showed the following gen uh, general result. So if you want to solve uh, um, an empirical risk minimization plus a regularization term, this equals precise, precisely to minimizing uh, over a uh, set of overall classifiers of the worst case uh, loss under a particular disturbance. So essentially regular, regularizing is like trying to solve a problem under some worst case perturbation. So this is a, a, a result in optimization. And in fact, you can show that this always holds. For, so for any reasonable regularizer, uh, you can write this down. Maybe it's difficult to write, but this equivalence always holds. So maybe another approach 
to uh, uh, for our analysts to say, well, you know, instead of trying to find simple models, we're going to, we're going to try to find models that are able to uh, with, with, uh, withstand uh, perturbations. In some sense, to have less attention, to forget uh, the exact details of the data, just to be able to sort of figure out what's going on. So the message of this uh, uh, slide is that instead of trying to regularize, uh, if you want to generalize, well, really what you can do is add noise to your data or perturb uh, your inputs. That's, um, that's the message. So um, let, we'll go back to that towards the end of the talk. All right, so, and, and, but besides, if you don't want to think about generalization, there are some pretty good reasons why you should uh, uh, consider risk, especially since in applications, uh, uh, that's something that uh, often happens. And I'll briefly talk about smart grids uh, towards the end of my talk. So we want scalability. So we want to solve large problems. We want to have formal guarantees, because we need to publish. And we would like to have interpretability, which currently we do not have, um, but that's something we would also like to have. All right. So at this point, there is a um, um, sort of um, truth in advertising. Everything that I'm going to do now, uh, all the prompts are going to be very hard computationally. So let's ignore complexity for the rest of this talk. All right. So uh, uh, we'll start with uh, um, uh, looking at the robust approach for uh, NDPs for large NDPs. So uh, the setting is a plan pro setting problem. So I have, a, I have a sort of model, but my model is not very good. I don't really believe my model too much. And the reason I don't believe it is that maybe I have a simulator that I'm using, or maybe I have some time-changing dynamics. So I'm not sure really what the model is, but I have some model. So here you see a, a problem where um, the, tra the transition probability uh, from a, a state is, is given. Uh, so now I have instead uh, some uncertainty about those transitions. So I'm not sure whether it's exactly 0 0.2, but rather maybe it's, there is a small interval uh, around it. And, and one thing that we showed in the past is that uh, uh, there is, in NDPs in particular, there is this phenomenon of uncertainty amplification. So a small mistake that you make in the beginning can explode <coughs> after uh, a few steps because simply you're not going to get where you think uh, that you're going, uh, you're going to get. So this is potentially a, a real issue uh, in, in applications. So we'll look at uh, what's known the, the mathematical piece known as robust MDP. So a robust MDP is the same as an MDP, so you have a, a state action rewards as before. But now you're not sure exactly what your transitions are. So instead of having a transition function, you have a transition set. And then, and basically, what we're trying to solve is the, the first type of transition. So that's uh, the worst case objective. So I'm trying to find a policy that would be good against, uh, or the best policy against the worst possible model in my set, the worst possible perturbation. So uh, um, this is uh, if the robust value function for a fixed policy would be something like that. So my value function, this is, uh, uh, is going to be uh, the expected discount reward, but under the worst possible, uh, worst, worst possible uh, transitions. So the way you should think about how would I simulate it? So I start from say S0, and then I can move to all possible say S1, S2, S3. I need at this point to choose the worst possible transition. And let's suppose that this, the worst possible, possible one is S3. And then again, I need to, so, so, to choose the worst possible transition probability according to my measure. So what you see here, it's going to be very difficult for me to simulate. Because when I simulate, I cannot simulate from my, the model, because I don't believe my model. Instead, I need to simulate from the worst possible model in my model set. But this one can be very bad, and I don't know which one it is. There are probably many of them. And there are probably many of them, indeed. So it turns out that you can solve, if you wish, uh, the robust Bellman equation. So this is, uh, um, I mean, for simplicity, everything is, is in uh, uh, discrete time and uh, uh, finite set state space. Everything uh, works if, if you're going to move to continuous time and infinite state space. Um, so this is a, the robust Bellman equation. So the value function equals the reward plus uh, um, the discount factor times uh, the, the worst possible transition uh, the worst possible value under your model. So it turns out that this is uh, amenable to uh, a false iteration and value iteration approach. This has been known for uh, um, 10 years now. Uh, but it does not scale. It's not, it was well known how to scale those up to large problems because 
Well, here's the problem. For standard uh, uh, non-robust problems, um, it's pretty easy to, uh, to do fun functional approximation. So this is a linear functional approximation. I'm, I'm assuming you're all aware of that, so I try to approximate my value function by some constants feature, uh, feature vectors time uh, 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 parameter value, which I'm trying to learn. So for standard robust, non-robust problem, this is uh, uh, my value function. There is no end here. And basically, I can sample it and reverse. And I can sample it in a more clever way, in a less clever way. I can do sampling and regress. I can do to the algorithm. All of them are going to be based on sample and regress. But I cannot regress from the worst case model. How would I know which is the worst case model before I'm able to, to estimate uh, the value itself? So I don't know how to regress, and that's really the core of the issue. Not being able to, to sample from the worst case uh, uh, model. So um, we do know how to solve it, and we're using the, the Google idea of uh, bootstrapping. And the algorithm is really very simple. So I sample state x1 to xn. And then at every iteration, I generate uh, regression targets. So I solve this, uh, this very simple equation with my previously uh, assumed, uh, uh, assumed model. So I I, at iteration k, I, I find w and k. And then I basically uh, solve this problem. The assumption is that solving this infimum is easy if you know your approximation. And then once I have the, uh, the targets, I can do uh, I can regress wk plus one using say the squares, iterate, and I'm done. So this is um, it's very simple. It's based on on uh, on, on the notion that uh, uh, that you can you can pretend that your previous estimation is good. And it should turn out that you can even prove things like it converges, you have error bounds, everything will still, uh, will still work, you can do policy improvement. So this in some sense is a, is a, solved, uh, is a solved problem. So let's go back, back to making money. So the American put option. So this is, we have a, an execution uh, price of uh, K, we have a horizon of T, and the question is when to exit. And of course, here it's an easy question. Would you maximize your expected profit? Uh, there are no issues of reward learning as in standard stuff because it's money in the pocket. It's pretty simple. So you can formulate this problem as an MPP, and you can look at price transitions. You can estimate them from, from historical data. In fact, you can build multiple models. And, and the reason here is that uh, you can think about this process as a, as a mean reverting process or uh, as the solution to certain SDEs and so forth. However, even if this thing is a little bit Google stock, so even for, for, for a stock as, uh, as liquid as Google, um, certainly do not believe the estimation to be correct. So the question is, uh, what are you going to do? So we, here we show an experiment that we're, where uh, the true model that we build, in the transition uh, depending on, on price, and you have what's known as a second order price reverting uh, process. Um, I'll get the details. Uh, after, after the talk, we're going to be making money. And then uh, the model that's trying to estimate has constant transitions. So what you see here is that we have mismatch in the model class itself, not just in the parameter that we're trying to learn. And the graph that we show here is this is a, a value A, and this is the probability of making more profits than A. So in zero, this is the probability of making a profit. So we see that the nominal policy makes a profit in about uh, 35% of the time, while the robust pro policy makes a profit but 63% of the time, and we'll see here how things uh, decline. So you manage to make some profit uh, and manage to pass above uh, 50%. So, and that's sort of the moral of the story, that um, you can be robust to model misspecification, not just to model parameters being a little bit off. All right. So now I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a seemingly different problem, which is uh, optimizing the conditional value at risk, also known as expected shortfall. Let me just remind you guys what is uh, the conditional value at risk called uh, C-bar. So here we have a random variable, x. Uh, we look at alpha quanta, we think about alpha as, uh, say, 5%. And the alpha C-bar, or the alpha expected shortfall, the conditional expectation given that we're below the alpha percentile. So if you think about it, something bad is happening to us, this is already happening. Like, shit already hit the fan. Now how bad is it going to get? 
That's really the question that we ask. So, uh, and, and that's a, a pretty common, uh, pretty common uh, risk measure in finance. And the, uh, the idea here is to make it very sensitive to where disastrous events, so events that happen in detail, are going to move your, uh, your conditional value at risk. So how do you estimate it? Well, estimating the expected world is easy, right? That's just an empirical mean. Ex estimating the, uh, the, the, the C bar, that's also pretty easy. Just enumerate your, your uh, rewards, take the alpha and worst one, take the empirical mean, and you're all set. All right. So uh, what we're going to do now is going to talk about uh, uh, policy optimization. So we encode the policy here uh, with uh, some parameters. Uh, say um, the parameters that govern a, a, a big network. There is a stochastic system that is going to be affected by the parameters, and our payoff function is going to be affected by stochastic system, and the parameter itself is going to give, give us our payoff. <coughs> so this is pretty common in robotics, in, 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 in smart grids, in games, in any application. It's very convenient. People are doing this all the time. Um, the standard objective is to maximize your expected reward. And indeed, you can derive a formula for the policy gradient of, uh, of the expected reward. We're going to look at the risk sensitive uh, uh, view. So we're going to look at something which is like uh, find the parameters. So this thing about it is find the parameter of my, my neural network uh, to, uh, to maximize uh, the conditional value of this. So uh, this problem has been uh, studied before, but only in finance uh, uh, setting. And the reason that, 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 that it was studied there is that basically expectations that don't matter. Uh, what matters in finance is risk. And it turned out that you can derive from like uh, for, for uh, uh, optimization of risk. However, there is an issue there. Uh, and the issue is that in finance, you don't care about your effect on the stochastic system. So you're not going to affect the market. If you have a very complex portfolio or a set of strategies that you're going to execute, uh, typically you don't assume that you're going to affect the market. You need to be really, really big to do that. But for us, if we're in robotics or uh, uh, game playing, well, certainly we're going to affect the system because we're controlling the system directly. So uh, previous results uh, are, are not, I mean, are really not, not, not relevant uh, for the kind of research uh, that we're, we're looking into. So what we're going to do is going to show you how to compute the gradient of the, of the CVAR and how to sample it. Uh, and it's really very simple. So uh, this is a likelihood ratio uh, approach. So this is, a, this is known as a likelihood ratio uh, estimation. So I want to uh, take the gradient of my expected utility. And this is just rewriting it. Um, some technical details are omitted. I can take the gradient inside, multiply by, by the, the, the probability, by the PDF, and just take the expectation. And to estimate that, basically, I can estimate it uh, like empirically, or if you, if you prefer, you can take the log of uh, trajectory. So this is known as, this has been around uh, uh, since the 1990s. This is a, uh, um, this, this is a policy gradient, so the likelihood ratio method. This has been around for ages. Uh, so very simple. I can take uh, n samples if I know how to compute uh, the likelihood function of my sample, I'm all set. Easy, easy breezy. I can plug my, my gradient to your favorite, uh, uh, your favorite uh, policy representation. All right, so maybe I can do the same for the C bar. So maybe I can just take my estimation and just say, well, you know, take the, your estimate here and plug it in. Instead of looking at all the samples, but just look at the alpha and worst samples, and you're all set. But now comes calculus for the rest. So remember calculus 101 or 102? Um, so when you're trying to obtain, to, to derive a function that has this form, so the integral from minus infinity to q, there is a small issue here, and that's whether or not q depends on, on your parameters or not. In our problem, it does depend on the parameters. So you cannot derive it naively here. You have to, fix, to, to take into account the fact that you're going to affect the location of this of this Q of alpha. And this is really the most interesting place because where things are happening are here, around the or around the Q alpha. That's going to have the biggest effect on the gradient. So it's not only a technical thing, it's also a material thing. You're really going to affect where the quantile is located. But uh, now you can apply a uh, uh, Leibniz integral uh, law, and you have, you have this correction term. This correction term is potentially larger 
than all everything that we see here, but now we have a formula. And this is a, a, a new formula for the gradient of, uh, of the C bar. And it turned out it's pretty easy to simulate, to, uh, to estimate it. Basically, the only thing that you need to do is you need to estimate the empirical runtime. That gives you uh, an estimation approach. It's biased, however, it's biased, it can be controlled. So it's a biased estimate, but it's not terribly so. And now you can use your favorite algorithm uh, to get convergence. So let's go a bit deeper. So what is happening here? He said that to regularize, what you're really doing is, is you need to look at, to make the problem uh, of, um, re resilient to a perturbation, to forgetting in some sense. So remember this, uh, this uh, motivation that we had before? So we have two routes. One here is sort of uh, a shorter route, but potentially more problematic. Uh, uh, and the other one is longer, but potentially, short, uh, potentially uh, um, it's going to be, it has less risk uh, uh, in it. So it turns out that we can prove the following result. And this is our equivalent result. So for, uh, it, it basically a perturbation, uh, uh, it's a perturbation resilience result. So now what you need to do is we need to take all the multiplicative perturbations. So here we have a transition probability. This is an, 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 um, the true transition probability, and this is the budget that we give. Uh, oh, this is the perturbation. So this is our p is our model, and p hat is what we actually have. And we tie uh, in per trajectory uh, this, uh, those perturbations so that the multiplication is less than some parameter. So what this tells us is the worst cannot happen in every time. So if something really bad happened to me, I'm completely off the model in my first transition, well, after that, things should not be too bad. If things are bad all the time, then I'm way off in terms of my model. So, and we can think about the set of all possible perturbation for a particular budget theta as delta P, uh, delta L sub, L sub eta. So the result, which I think is kind of surprising, it's written here for a class, in the following. If you're going to, to if you look at this, at the conditional value at risk, uh, quantile 1 over eta, so think about eta as say 10 or 100. Uh, that's going to lead to a 10, 10 percentile or 1 percentile uh, C bar of your cost. That equals uh, looking at the expected utility, but under the worst case perturbations. So what it tells you that what C bar is really doing is looking at the worst case perturbation under a very particular multiplicative perturbation model. And that's exactly what it's doing. It's not doing anything else. It's actually, it looks like it's solving a risk uh, on your trajectory. But really what it's doing is solving perturbation in terms of expected cost under a particular model. Uh, so it's robustness in a very broad sense. And in fact, you can show that the same holds for any problem. So if you have here any risk measure that has some, some convexity properties, which I'm not going to uh, discuss now, it, it will have uh, such a form. Writing delta of eta may not be as convenient as it is here. Maybe I cannot fit it on a slide. Maybe it's not even computable in a convenient way. But that is a property of all risk uh, measures, or at least all reasonable risk measures. Whenever you see you're solving a risk sensitive problem, you're really trying to solve a perturbation uh, robust problem. And wherever you're trying to solve a perturbation robust problem, you're solving a risk problem. There is no difference between the two. So, how, how, am I, how am I doing my time? Five minutes? That's great. So I want to just uh, briefly mention uh, uh, one of the problems that I've been working on uh, quite extensively in the last, uh, I guess, six or seven years, and that's uh, asset management in power grids. I want to explain to you, I mean, this is a change of gear, but I want to explain why risk is important and what kind of problems people in the field of RL that are more on the engineering side uh, are looking into. So this is a, a probably the third largest engineering man-made system on the planet. The first two are, are a Chinese and an American power grid. So this is a power grid, it has 15,000 nodes, that's a pan-European power grid, so the, the, the European system is synchronized between uh, Norway in the north and I guess Italy or to some extent uh, uh, Greece in, in the south. Um, it has 15,000 nodes, it has about 80,000 buses, so 80 buses line. This is just a high voltage uh, uh, high voltage system. And, and the problem is very, very, I mean, the problem in power is that the supply must equal demand at 
every given point in time. So supply must equal demand and uh, supply must equal demand in different locations. So you see how far things are from, from the south uh, to the north uh, of Europe. And the problem that is at hand is the following. We need to decide which asset we're going to take offline. So there are assets here, say this power line or maybe some nuclear power plant here that are going to be taken offline for maintenance. They want to be maintained. And the question is, when can they do that? Now, this may seem like a, like a minor issue, but if you take something offline, then the grid must still operate. You will not be willing to tolerate uh, not having power in your system. So, so basically, uh, that's, a, that's a problem that we want to solve. We have phenomenal simulator. So we have excellent simulators that are, were built by, uh, by uh, uh, the best and brightest in the field. And the question is, uh, that we're trying to do the same problem is what order, or it's a scheduled problem of order of maintenance. And uh, um, this is something we are doing actively. We have been doing it for several years with uh, the European, uh, the ENTSO, that's a European uh, uh, system operator. Uh, and, and this is a, a really a risk, a risk assessment and risk uh, mitigation problem. Because normally things are going to work out. So if you just look at expectations, things are going to work out. Now this one you can say, well, why don't you just give it, make it into a, an expected world problem and solve it? The issue is that we don't really have a, know how to give a dollar value for um, blackouts. Sometimes it's easy if you have a blackout here or a fit of in, in, in this room for 30 minutes. You know, it's probably something that we can be quantified into euros. Sometimes it's very difficult. If you have a blackout in, uh, say, Norway in the winter, that's a different story. If, if, even three or four hours can have devastating effects. So, so this is the kind of problem that we're looking at. Uh, at. I don't have time, and they have to tell you more about it. Uh, uh, this is the scale of, uh, of, of the problem we're interested in. And just, just to give you an idea, to, to sort of solve a small country like, like Belgium or, or, uh, or uh, sort of one fourth of uh, France is something that takes many, many, many hours of uh, compute time and simulation, and we do it with policy, with policy projects, and that's actually something that has been implemented. All right, so, uh, uh, so to conclude, uh, risk sensitivity is crucial to decision making. Uh, um, and I think the main message that I want to, to bring that if you want to generalize, you need to be robust. If you want to be robust, at least to some perturbation, you can solve CVAR. If you're not happy with CVAR, it's like a, the Groucho Marx uh, um, a joke. If you're not happy with that, I have other risk measures to sell you. So there are other risk measures that you can, that you can handle. And in fact, I would argue that any, any problem that you're going to solve is going to be a risk sensitive problem, as long as you want, if you want to generalize. There is no other type of problem uh, that is out there. And I talked a little bit about uh, power grids, but uh, there, are, there are some, some applications that are pretty, pretty cool in health. Uh, in robotics, cyber, and obviously in finance, that uh, bred all this line of research. So, with that, we'll conclude. Take a head of time. Thank you.